Hello, everyone. This is Trip, and I'm here with John Dominique Crossan. And this, this is a lure, an invitation. It is the advent of the Advent class that we are doing together called Christmas Stories. And um, we're going to have some fun here, but this is the heads up. If you're watching this or listening to this and you want to get you, you want to get your Bible nerd on this Advent season, then you want to go to Crossan through Advent.com. Look at that. There's even the URL on the bottom of the screen, Dom. That's what I'm talking about. Perfect. So this is promotion or seduction, whichever your audience prefers. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, you know, those of us that uh, uh, are big uh, process theology fans, we just use the word lure because yes. it's got That's that right. divine arrows to it. It's more polite. You notice my, my face is red, red with excitement. Ooh, watch out. <laughs> I need, so, I need my lighting, not my face fixed up anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, this uh, this Advent each week um, live on Monday afternoons uh, if you're on the East Coast, but the video and audio will be available on the resource page afterwards. Uh, Dom and I are going to dig into the uh, biblical uh, Christmas stories and unpack them. Um, and if you know Dom, you know that he's not just a professional biblical scholar. He also is a wonderful communicator. Uh, on top of those, we'll also be able to send in questions and such about the book he wrote with Marcus Borg, The First Christmas, um, you, which I interviewed you about it when it came out, and I re-listened yes. to that interview, Dom. My accent, much more Southern then. Okay, right. Did my Irish accent change? <laughs> you're solid. You're solid. See, I, I just moved to California then. Then I had time in Scotland, so it's really dying back down. I got to okay. – I know. And I sounded so young. Sounded so young, but um, anyway, we're real excited about it, and uh, over 2,500 people have already signed up, so oh yeah, crossing through advent.com, link on the blog post and everything related to this. So uh, Dom, have you ever had over 2,000 people in a Bible study before? No, no, <laughs> 2,049 maybe, no, no. 2,499, no, 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 not even close. I know, I and and um, you know, Jesus didn't even have the technology to do a live Bible study with that many people. So he had a very strong voice, apparently. But you know, <laughs> but then, but the people in the back were getting cheesemakers. That's right; they got it all wrong. That's why you had so much trouble with early Christianity. Half of them didn't get the message. They were they were quite convinced they got it. I'm sure he said, "Blessed are the squeaker." <laughs> He's talking about the mice. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Well, uh, you know, one of the things about the Christmas stories in the New Testament is uh, if you start to wrestle with them historically and think about them in their context and how they emerged in the early church, um, there could be, you could say that a lot of Christians today are misunderstanding the message of Christmas. And, and I think that's one of the gifts uh, your scholarship uh, throughout your career has done um, in what you and Marcus did in the book and what I hope we do in the class yeah. is give people back the Christmas stories in ways yeah. that the challenge of the coming of Christ is something we wrestle with again. Yeah. yeah. But I was deliberately saying when we're going to celebrate it, we're going to question it and we're going to explain it. But celebration is important too, for as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. So I was uh, hanging out with about 20 or so uh, friends who also went to divinity school um, with me at Wake Forest University's divinity school where you came and spoke the first time we met. Yes. Um, 14 years ago. Ooh, so, my, <laughs> <laughs> my uh, high school son was six months old, and uh, I have a very fun picture of the three of us. He has I grown the most that. since then. <laughs> was he was he harmed <laughs> was he harmed for life by that encounter? <laughs> no, just us whispering heresies over the over the. <laughs> <laughs> over the over the little carry case but um we when hanging out with a bunch of ministers knowing we were going to do this i said uh hey uh, what are the things that you remember wrestling with when you were in divinity school learning the histor history behind it the biblical matrix and such that uh if our congregations knew them and we took them seriously would make christmas alive again and so we we, we uh group worked six statements and the idea is I'll read it. And then you say whatever you want, but not too much because we want them to come join the class. But you, the wet the whistle, as my grandpa would say, though I don't know what that exactly means, wetting of the whistle. 
wetting of the whistle is an Irish expression that means you're into into <laughs> liquor. Oh, you well. You don't, you don't wet your whistle with water. Oh, okay. Well, then. The, well, it is a homebrew ishkabaha. Christianity. You use Ishkabaha, the water of life. <laughs> 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 well, now I like wet the whistle more. So, <laughs> Dom is going to wet your whistle. <laughs> And the first, the first statement uh, that you learn when wrestling with the biblical text in an academic context, it could give life to the church again if they took it seriously, is one, there are two different birth narratives in the New Testament, and most of its authors didn't know about the birth stories. Yes, basically, that's all correct. Um, it's important that we're talking about the Christmas stories. We didn't say the Christmas story, as most people would say. We do kind of combine them into the crib and we get the shepherds in there and we get the wise men in there and there's no problems and everything is lovely. Except out of respect for the authors, if you think they're inspired by God, fine, let's have a little respect for inspiration. What are they trying to say? Why are they so completely different? That's a factual statement. They are completely different. And if you work hard enough, you might be able to get them together, though it's hard to figure out going into Egypt and going to the temple, you might be able to get them into one story because we're good at that type of stuff. But out of respect for the authors, I would like to ask, what does each one want to say before we collapse them into bed together? <laughs> what does Luke want to say? Why does Matthew want to say? And when we're at it, why does Mark and John have an infancy story? So yeah, I'd want to ask those questions. And do you, do you think that... Um the the kind of the way the text functions so often in a liturgical and confessional space as if the the new testament speaks with one single voice um that that yes that in some sense does violence like to each of the text and the author's voices but i wonder if it also ends up uh problematizing uh even even the context for reading the scriptures again right like part of the difficulty um, and even say Paul, for example, who has no reference to Mary, Jesus and his family and all that kind of stuff outside of, you know, conflict, maybe with James and company. Um, w w when we go to look at these two particular narratives, I is there something that uh, uh, or what things get missed when we collapse all of the New Testament into kind of one harmonious single uh, narrative? Okay. I mean, I have nothing against Irish stew. <laughs> so if we want to make the New Testament into a stew with everything in there, I, I doubt if it's very functional <laughs> for, like that. They are different. And you know, let me give an example. At what stage is your child ever going to say, if they hear the story, you know, mommy, you know, daddy, if this magic star no kids have no problem with magic stars, of course. This magic star leads these men, whoever they, whatever they're called, magic, magic men, or whatever they're called. It leads them all the way to Bethlehem and shows them the house. Why did they stop off at Jerusalem to ask for directions, mammy? Now, the age at which the child asks you that is called the age of reason. And some people don't get it till they're 40 or 50, but that's, you know, that's fine. It's really an obvious question. And somebody might say, since we all know men never ask for directions, in any case, I don't believe this story. Um, so anyone who's thinking, and as soon as you start thinking, as I said, it's called the age of reason, you should ask questions. If the story can't sustain questions, if the author can't sustain questions, then the author doesn't know what the author is doing. They're incompetent. So I have no problem. I know exactly, I'm sorry to put it bluntly, I know exactly why Matthew, and that's going to be one of our themes when we get to talk about it, I know exactly why Matthew has them stop off at Jerusalem. And I thought he knows exactly what he's doing. And it's not, oh, I forgot the star. Oops, forgot the star, I need directions. Matthew and Luke know exactly what they intend to do and do it superbly. And to mix them all up together into a mishmash is indefensible to either, to both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, that makes sense. All right. All right. Here we go. Number two. Number two. See, I'm always tempted to keep asking okay. questions, Dom, but we have a whole month of fun. Uh, yeah. Number two. The birth narratives were late additions textually to the New Testament. And then when one of our clergy said that, other one said, I would really like it to be a late addition to uh, the required theology for attending my church because I so often get these kinds of questions. But w w when you think about the composition of, of the gospel narratives, the sayings, documents, and all that kind of things, when it, it, what occasion or brought about uh, the birth narratives uh, as, as late additions to the textual um, legacy of the early church? Oh, absolutely, they're late. They're late, absolutely, and independent of one another. I think the general background you have to know is if you imagine, and I'll show this when we're talking about it, if you imagine an ancient papyrus scroll, I mean, it would drive you crazy. It's wall-to-wall -wall capital letters. Even, even when I'm looking at one, knowing Greek, I'd hate to do it in English. Imagine a newspaper that's all capitals, no breaks, wall-to-wall. -wall. You would be so happy if somebody put a little introduction up front. You know, like you get when you open a book and you read the cover and you find out and you look at the index, at least a little kind of a short story, an introduction, an overture that kind of gets you into the story. We, we do it all the time. If you're watching a movie before the before it's announced where it's from, you get a kind of a headline into the story, of course. So that's the function of these. Now, let me go from the sublime to the ridiculous for a moment to myself. I write a book. The first thing I write is not the preface. I write the book, then I write the preface. And it's absolutely fantastic how well the book and the preface go together. The preface leads right into the book. It's marvelous. I knew right from the beginning everything I intended to do and did it perfectly. Of course not. Everyone knows you write the preface or the overture or the prologue or whatever you call the thing last and you line it up for your book. So along comes Luke, he's finished his book and now he's going to give, <laughs> be reader friendly or hearer friendly and give them a overture to his book. Not the first chapter, an overture. It's like, get this down guys. And yet kind of know how to read the book. Matthew says the same thing. Now, both of them chose to do an infancy story. Mark, for example, wanted an introduction and he used the model of John the Baptist. So when you read Mark and find out in the beginning what happens to John, oops, you're warned, this may happen to Jesus. And then John wants an introduction and he says, eh, I'm not interested in any of these birth stories. Jesus is the Logos incarnate. Wow, that's a sensational one. The Logos is the intelligibility of the universe made incarnate in Jesus. Wow, that gets you ready for Jesus walking around like God in sandals. So the function of that is not only is it late, but it's late when, wrote, when excuse me, Luke wrote his gospel or Mark wrote their gospels. That was the last thing they wrote. Not the first thing. Yeah, no, I think that's I, I think that's really helpful. And uh, our authors, at least uh, ones with a quality editor, you know, make those suggestions. Hey, you know what? Maybe you should do, work out all the middle, and then you write that conclusion, then go back to the beginning and tell everyone what you're about to do. Yeah, exactly. Um, My author Harper drilled that into me for years. He said, <laughs> "Say what you're going to do. Do it. Say that you've done it." <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. All right. Number three, number three, redaction criticism makes the narratives pop. Um, the, the narratives, the birth narratives makes more sense when you spend time looking uh, at what that particular gospel uh, author is doing. Well, in a way, that's what we've just described. Obviously, anyone who reads Luke's gospel, leave out the, the, the birth stories. If you read Luke's gospel, starting say chapter three, same with Matthew, you know, you're kind of in different worlds. You really are in different worlds. Now, if, they, if the function of these Gospels is to give you a sort of an outline, if you will, like a table of contents, as it were, but a narrative form, then they couldn't possibly have the same one. It would be like you and I writing a 
different our books. And then lo and behold, we came up with the same preface. Oops, <laughs> we're in trouble. <laughs> so they couldn't be the same. So redaction criticism, <laughs> that's a word, by the way, we're using now at the moment we get government documents that are redacted. When you black out something, that's censored. That's not redacted. <laughs> redacted is what your editor does when he suggests, instead of using that word, why don't you use this word? Or instead of that sentence, this that's redacting. That's changing around the content as a word. Black marks are censorship. We just don't want to say it. So redaction criticism, as used in the New Testament, means exactly that. When, for example, Luke, Luke's gospel, there's a consensus of scholarship that his major source is Mark. And we have Mark. So I can read Mark here, parallel columns, same as two of Matthew, of course. I can read Matthew, Mark, Luke in parallel columns and read them horizontally. And I can see what, what Matthew is doing to Mark and what Luke is doing to Mark and even compare all three of them, which is the way any scholar reads the New Testament in parallel columns. <laughs> the, my, my parallel column one in Greek is almost worn. It's yellow with, with usage. So that's how you do it. You're, it helps you get into the mind of the author. So for example, if Mark says Jesus is a tectone, we translate as a carpenter. Well, I would say day labor is closer, but I noticed that Matthew doesn't like that. Matthew says his father was a tectone, kind of gets around. And Luke simply omits the whole thing. Ah, so they don't like that term tectone. They're a little bit nervous, embarrassed by it. So he's, he's not a big shot carpenter, <laughs> like we might think of somebody today. He's probably a day laborer. Maybe he works with wood, maybe he works with stone. But they kind of don't seem at home with saying Jesus is a tectone. So I read that reading that way. I don't get a reading mark. So that's redaction criticism. And it's absolute fun. It's like reading three witnesses in a, you know, in a court of law or watching a movie where you're getting three different stories or a showman type and you're figuring out this one says this, this one. And you have to read this way. You have to hold all the stories in your mind. Otherwise, you don't get it. Do you, do you think that uh, one of the reasons I think uh, clergy benefit from thinking about redaction criticism is that just like our congregations, um, the New Testament has canonized a multiplicity of diverse voices. And so often perverse religion says uh, wants to act as if the one voice, maybe the one from the pulpit or the one from the church fathers or the one from your creed is the one voice that's there. And if we treat the diversity of testimonies in scripture that way, we silence the uniqueness of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, Paul, and all that kind of thing. Um, and, and I think when we – redaction criticism is often a gift to faith communities to go, no, no, we actually canonize if you wanted to just look at the surface level, contradictory stories. But what do they hold? What do they hold in common? What are they speaking to? Uh, what is it that animates the church trusting this multiplicity of, of narratives as the the stories we wrestle with to understand ourselves and our our task as people of faith? Yeah, when I when I preached, when I was a priest and I preached on Sunday, I was living in a monastery, but we went out to the local parishes on Sunday. I'm talking now. This would be the sixties. <laughs> last century, I, I, and there was a text to read. I always did redaction criticism from the pulpit, as it were. But, you know, if I was supposed to speak about what Mark said, I said what Luke and Matthew did to him, too. And I did it in such a way that you could get almost three <laughs> times the value from it. I didn't do it in terms of, you know, um, you had to be very careful how you did it. It was kind of not... We're trying to say, look, these are people thinking about this. So please go home and do the same thing. Go home and think. You, I, I've just shown you three people wrestling with something Jesus said. Go wrestle. Uh, mm -hmm. It worked very well. 
because otherwise it would not have been invited back. I wasn't the local parish priest. <laughs> I was in the local monastery, and if they didn't want me back every Sunday, this was in Waukegan, Illinois, if they didn't want me back every Sunday, I would be staying in the monastery, <laughs> you know, going to the monastic mass. Yeah. Yeah. I, I um, uh, One of the things I've always enjoyed about uh, how that how redaction criticism actually helps in the life of the church is um, – the, if you just think of, uh, especially when I was a minister at a UCC church in Los Angeles, which is uh, the more one of the more progressive Protestant denominations, we had quite a few congregants who, if you, there's no chance they're going to get through the creed. Um, if you asked them why they were there, they're like, "Well, I'm trying to be a follower of Jesus, and I have a spiritual sense of the transcendence, and this is about as close as I get." And a lot of Christians would be like, well, then, you know, I don't know if they're a Christian and should be here. And I'm like, well, I don't know. That's about that's about as high a Christology as Mark has sometimes. You know, you yeah. don't get a virgin conception and you're scared and don't tell anyone at the end. Um, and I think the the multiplicity of testimonies getting the dignity of canon uh, can actually help us make space for more people that are, say, during Advent and thinking about the incarnation, yeah. and the way the tradition shows up, go, we've honored uh, we've honored the skeptical voice and the triumphant cosmic one of John when it comes to who made it to canon. Yeah. And the only thing I would encourage people is don't just be skeptical and um, ask questions, not rhetorical questions. And once you begin to think in terms of what Luke is doing, then there, you can get, get answers. And I don't mean answers. That's it. Now we're closed because you can go back again and again and again. But you're asking questions. You're not having doubts. Doubts, doubts are something you get when you were, made the mistake of being certain. You know, <laughs> quite, yeah, you know that goes between certain. Now I have a doubt. Uh, questions are being human. If you don't ask questions, yeah. then something has gone t terribly wrong. Political questions, religious questions. If you if you're told you can't ask questions, then be very careful. You're you're into yeah. something that ain't good for you. Religious, political, ethnic, national, local, anything. Mm -hmm. But ask questions. And the only way you can if, if you go back to my question, if you ask, why did the Magi stop off at Jerusalem? The only way you can answer that is not the psychology of the Magi or their camels needed water or something. What you have to ask is, why does Matthew say they stopped off at Jerusalem? We don't know why they stopped. We don't even know if they existed. But why does Matthew? have them stop, which will lead into why does Matthew need them? Luke doesn't. Why does Matthew have them as magi? You know, so all the questions lead into other questions. And it's marvelous. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I think that element of curiosity is very important. Um, all right. Okay, so number four. Number four. We avoid the challenge of Christmas stories by harmonizing them, sentimentalizing them, and insisting on their facticity. Yeah, I mean, it's it's perfectly valid to ask. Um, it's perfectly valid to ask factual questions, of course. But that's not the only question that has to be asked. The purpose of the author, you know, Jesus tells a good Samaritan parable. Supposing everyone in the audience after the parable is over said, gee, I, I don't know, did that really happen? And there's a big argument going on. Yes, it did. The, Jesus wouldn't tell a lie. Of course it is. He's just telling us some local gossip. And Jesus will be tearing his hair out. Because the whole purpose of the story is to go and do likewise. <clears throat> and even though it's a parable and he just made it up and it never happened. And even though there are donkeys and denarii and inns and Samaritans and priests and Levites, all of that doesn't mean it's not a parable. In fact, one of Jesus's famous statements not recorded in the gospel is, it's a parable, dummy. <laughs> but, but then at the end, he says, go and do likewise. Now, if I read a parable, how do I like, I must disguise myself as a Samaritan and cruise up and down the Jerusalem Jericho Road and see if I can find somebody in the ditch. How do I go and do likewise? Oops. I'm actually thinking, and that's the whole purpose of a parable, to tell you a story that makes you think. 
that lures you into thinking, to use your word from before. So now, if I'm going to say, and I will say it and explain it, Matthew 1 and 2 is a parable. Of course, there's all sorts of things in there that actually happen. There's a Jerusalem, there's a Bethlehem, there's a Herod. There's... It's a parable. And Luke is a different parable. And at the end of them, both of those authors, if they just wrote those two, would say, go and do likewise. And if you take it as history, you might say, well, that's very interesting. Now we know the story of Jesus. Nice. Very interesting. Let's get on with <laughs> something important. So parables lure you, invite you, provoke you <laughs> into activity. That's their whole purpose. And if you don't like parables, if I don't like parables, take it up with Jesus. He's the most famous parable that ever lived. And so I'm not surprised to find that the evangelist picked up this bad habit of fiction from Jesus. But it's very serious fiction. <laughs> His parables got him killed in a way. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is a... Uh... Um, uh, and I think that's why uh, the, uh, in our little debate among the ministers and in, in naming it, is it sometimes that by harmonizing them, you miss it sometimes by sentimentalizing it, uh, you miss the kind of address of the stories. Um, and then if you get in debates about the facticity of it, you miss it because the kind of parabolic nature that you're describing, um, if a parable is hard to sentimentalize a parable where your way of being is being called out. You know, it's hard to, in that kind of thing. Let, let me say a word about sent, sentimentalize. It, it, look at Matthew, for example. The, the mage I ask, where is the newborn king of the Jews? Now, <laughs> if you know world, world literature, don't go ask the local king, where's the newborn king of the king? Don't, don't do that. <laughs> it's a recipe for disaster for the new world. Anyway, they ask, where's the newborn? Je Jesus, king of the Jews. Now, the next time you find King of the Jews in Matthew's gospel, it's going to be on the cross of Jesus. So all of a sudden, it's like a huge shadow falls over the story in Matthew. And of course, it falls over it in Luke when they go to the temple and um, Simeon tells him about, you know, the sign of, <laughs> sign of disagreement. So to sentimentalize a story, it's the birth of a child, which is lovely. Of course, it's lovely. But there's a lot of births throughout history of children and today which are not lovely. And don't bespeak a life that's not going to be hard and brutal. So to sentimentalize it is an insult to the writers and to the story. It, it really is because they're not sentimentalizing. They really are. Yeah. All right. Number five. If your congregation doesn't understand Caesar, his reign, his kingdom, uh, they will not hear the stories as the author and the original audience did. Um, after the discussion of this, then a couple of ministers said, does Tom have an easy way to introduce historical titles of Caesar to congregations without getting fired? So. <laughs> well, I've been doing it for years. You know? <laughs> I've been saying, please before Jesus ever existed, and if Jesus had never existed, there was a human being in the Mediterranean world whose titles were Lord, the Lord, <laughs> the Son of God, God incarnate even, Redeemer of the world, by the way, Savior from sin, a Redeemer from sin, Savior of the world. Those were the titles of Caesar. If Jesus had never existed, they still would have been the title of Caesar and they made absolute sense to millions of people because how else would you explain the Roman Empire? It made sense. Now, whether it's true or not, it made sense. So the huge challenge is when you get this guy, this peasant from the Nazareth Ridge in Galilee and his people are claiming these titles for him, not the guy on the Palatine Hill in Rome, which kind of makes sense. The huge question of earliest Christianity is, was this a, a joke? 
and the Romans had no sense of humor and they didn't see that the people were just you know, having a little joke about Jesus. They weren't really serious. I don't think so. I think Rome understood as empires always understood who are its enemies, who are its threats. In this case, not a violent threat, but still a threat because people are going to ask, wait a minute, we have only one world. How can we have two lords, saviors, redeemers? We don't need to, one's enough. So if we know how Caesar operates, how does this guy Jesus operate? Now that's an honest to God, open-minded first century question. If I'm a happy pagan Roman and I just meet you and you seem to be a nice guy, and you got this weird idea about Jesus, I'm going to say to you, I understand Caesar because I see what he's doing for us. And what has Jesus done for us? Now, that is a first century question. It's a question you can ask Paul because the first century question, the person is not going to say, well, I, I don't believe people can ascend into heaven. Of course they can. It's in all the stories. <laughs> it's in all the papers. I don't believe people can be born of a virginal conception by God. Of course they do. What they're really asking is why should I believe it about your guy? And by the way, you can't claim to be unique either. You can't because I've heard the story about Caesar. What you can claim is how my guy will make a better life for the world than your guy. And if I ask you why, I'm going to say because we've had your guys come and gone. We've had them from the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks and the Syrians and the Egyptians. And now we have the Romans. Why do you really think it's going to be any better? Now, I might say, well, I, I'm not interested. Go away, go away. I, I'm quite happy. Sure. But some people will say, well, yeah, maybe I, I don't see what he's doing for me. I can barely make it with my feed my family. So he may be doing things for some people, but he ain't doing anything for me. Tell me about this guy, Jesus. Does he make house calls when you're sick? Oh yeah, we make house calls. Oh, that's interesting. That's the way it happened in the first century. It couldn't happen by simply saying, Jesus is the Lord and everyone says, ooh, wow, groovy. <laughs> No, groovy. <laughs> <laughs> bit, bit, a bit from the sixties. There, slip back. In. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that actually anticipated the sixth and, and final line we got out of uh, uh, the clergy um, discussing uh, what you gain in uh, div school, seminary, and such that would uh, really uh, level up the church's engagement. The Christmas stories. The last one is the virginal conception is easily misunderstood in a world with few miraculous birth stories. Today, we debate the mechanism of his divine conception instead of the, uh, the affirmation of his divine vocation. Yeah. I mean, it's like coming from that last previous question. I'm willing to say this, dear Christian, dear fellow Christian, if you don't know Caesar, you'll never know Christ. Simple as that. Well, that was straightforward. Very tweetable, Dom. Well, you never will. You, you, you may make, make up your own Christ. You may be absolutely happy with him, but you'll never understand the first century. Look, it's like, you know, supposing in the 30s in, in Germany, supposing in the 30s in Germany, you had Christians that were saying, Jesus align under Führer ist. Jesus is our only Führer. Now, that's an ordinary German word that means leader. Every, every, Boy Scout group, Girl Scout has, has a Führer. It's a, it's a nothing word, really. But in the 30s, at that precise moment, calling Jesus your only Führer would get you killed. Dachau in the morning. So again, in the first century, those terms that we mentioned can get you killed because you're saying he is and he ain't. And you're saying what, what's at stake is how the world should be run. What's at stake is civilization and <laughs> it's discontents. So that's a huge stake. It really is. And to sentimentalize or reduce it or the cop out of just wanting to talk whether it happened or not, let me be as clear as I can. Matthew 1 and 2, Luke 1 and 2 are parables. 
they're different parables jesus had many parables each of them says in effect go and do likewise at the end they're parables if you think that makes them you know just little funny stories and <laughs> you miss what story is all about yeah yeah well um i i feel like i feel like that was a whistle wedding exercise dom i mean you're the you're the you're the irish person here and since that's an irish saying I mean, like I, I, uh, I feel like, I feel like you're good at this, you know? Well, in Ireland, you know, they, my father was a, a bank manager and he'd get gifts at Christmas from his clients. And one of the gifts he used to get was pochine. Now pochine comes in a, in a bottle and it's clear. It looks like water. Now you could run your car on it, but it would ruin the engine. <laughs> So what it does to your internal organs, I'm not going to get into. I've never tasted it. I've smelled oh. it. Never, never gotten any closer than that. <laughs> but but that's what you wet your whistle with. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, one of the unique 